what we do combine are load effects. Dead loads and live loads cause bending moment shear forces in structural members. So do wind, so do earthquake. Those bending moments are combinable and those are the ones we combine. Very important. This is basic to the point of being, <laughs> you know, I, I even hesitate to bring it up, but, but this, is, this is very important to keep in mind. Along the same lines, how do we combine horizontal earthquake and vertical earthquake? You know, we, we do not. The, the vertical earthquake effect becomes, as I tried to point out, a manipulation of the dead load factor. Today, in seismic load combinations, we do not have fixed dead load factors. The dead load factor itself is a function of the seismicity at the site. So high seismicity sites, we are looking at dead load factors of 1.4 and 0.7. In low seismicity sites, the dead load factors are 1.2 and 0.9, something like that. So the dead load factors in the seismic load combinations will change as you go from California to Illinois. That, that, that's what has happened, the way we are doing things today. Under method 2 analytical procedure today, there are two separate and distinct methods of wind design. There is the general analytical procedure applicable to buildings of all heights and then there is low rise analytical procedure applicable to buildings having mean roof height not exceeding 60 feet. There is a simplified version of the low rise analytical procedure under method 1. Now you have a simplified version of the general analytical procedure under this label of alternate all heights method. Now although it is called all heights method, there is a height restriction of 75 feet. So <laughs> it will not cover everything, but, but many, many things that are built out there are shorter than 75 feet. So, so this, is, this is not, and th this is somewhat broader applicability than method one simplified design, but obviously it doesn't cover everything. Like I said, section 12.3.4 has all of the redundancy provisions in it. It's organized in this way. 12.3.4.1 outlines where you do not have to use the redundancy. If you have 1.3, you're going to be increasing your base shear by 30%. Do you need to carry that increase of 30% to other aspects of your design? And in many cases, you do not. And fortunately, the code has this user-friendly feature where it tells you specifically where you do not need to consider the redundancy factor. And hopefully we'll get to that point with the special seismic load combinations and the overstrength factor load combinations because right now you have to hunt throughout the code to find out where you have to use the overstrength factor. And that's not really fair to the code user. But in this case, it's very user friendly and it tells you exactly where you do not have to use rho. And then in section 12.3.4.2, it tells you, okay, we've got a couple of conditions that you can check out to see if you qualify for row of one. What this flowchart does is take everything that I've said and uh, put it all together in one place. So if, if you've had a little nap after lunch, all you need to know is what's on this flowchart here. Um, you start here and you ask yourself, is your diaphragm untopped steel decking or wood structural panels? If your answer is yes, and one of the following boxes is true, then you can assume flexible. If one of, the one of these three boxes is not true, then you have to go to the calculation and see, uh, compare your diaphragm calculation with your vertical resisting element drift. Uh, if you have what looks like it's going to be a rigid diaphragm, then you follow this and you see if you can um, comply with the prescriptive approach for the rigid diaphragm, if yes, then you assume rigid. If no, then you do have to go to calculating the deflections. The topic is significant 2009 IBC uh, chapter 19 changes, we, which are 
so I, I started with the IBC rather than 318 because that's why we need to be concerned about these changes. IBC chapter 19, as you know today, references 318.05 and when 2009 IBC becomes the basis of your code, the reference document will be 318.08. Uh, that would mean significant changes in the standard itself, which is what I will discuss. But just so that you know, it will also mean a little bit of a different look to chapter 19 of the code because chapter 19 today makes a number of amendments to ACI 318.05, precisely 16 amendments at this stage in 2006 IBC.